Sure. Thank you. Yes, I am a breast cancer medical oncologist uh, currently working at Duke in Durham, North Carolina. But before I came here, just about five years ago, my education, in fact, my upbringing has all been in Canada. So I'm a Canadian uh, by birth and by education, but that's where most of my academic career has been spent, was in Canada. And, you know, a number of years ago, probably over 15 years ago now, um, as I was treating individuals with breast cancer, I became very interested in some of the toxicities of the cancer treatments that we offer for our patients. And so when the aromatase inhibitors were used in women with estrogen sensitive breast cancer, I became interested in that. And then moving on from there, I became very interested in some of the newer therapies, in particular, trastuzumab and its impact on cardiovascular health and, and the toxicity associated with that treatment. So that's been a, a passion of mine and it's really sort of, um, I've continued to work on looking at what is the impact of cancer therapies that we give our patients over the last 15 to 20 years now? I think cardio-oncology is really a fairly new term, and you're correct. Not many individuals outside of a very few know what that means. It really refers to bringing together healthcare providers to optimize cardiovascular health so that we can provide patients with cancer with the best cancer treatment possible. So we know, for instance, that people are now aging, that cardiovascular disease and, and cancer are the two top causes of morbidity and mortality, at least in North America. And so when individuals come to us with a cancer diagnosis, we are often faced with someone who may have pre-existing cardiovascular disease or they have cardiovascular risk factors, and that can make it challenging to offer some of them the best cancer treatments that we have available for them. So cardio-oncology has emerged out of this idea that we really want to work together as a multidisciplinary team to provide cardiovascular care, or at least optimize cardiovascular health, so we can give individuals the best cancer therapy possible. You know, it's very interesting that as I've seen the whole field of cardio-oncology grow over the last 15 years or so, there has been a significant uptake by cardiologists, and I think they are eager to learn about cancer therapies and how they can work to try and um, help us treat patients with the best cancer therapy. But I would say we still have a great deal more education to do amongst the oncologists. So in many of the professional societies that you see or the meetings that I go to, I would say perhaps 15% or so of those individuals in that space, in that area of cardio-oncology are oncologists. So they're obviously oncologists are an integral part of the team. And I think there's a great deal more that we have to do with regards to educating our oncology colleagues. We have seen huge advances in the treatment of breast cancer. People are surviving a diagnosis of breast cancer. And it, we've also seen that people even diagnosed with advanced breast cancer are living longer, five years or longer. And so while as oncologists, we've always focused on how do we cure these people? How do we make have them live longer with their disease? I think now that we've achieved many of these goals, we need, we're now understanding that the consequences of our treatment can cause long-term toxicity or side effects, including detrimental impact on their cardiovascular health. So we're now seeing women who, you know, postmenopausal women who are out several years from their cancer diagnosis, they're actual, are more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than they are of their breast cancer. And we're also seeing things that in terms of the impact of cancer treatments on exercise capacity, which is greatly diminished. We're seeing people who develop left ventricular dysfunction from some of the drugs and heart failure. So I think there's been a slow uh, aware, increasing awareness of this, of these potential toxicities. And the realization that yes, it's important that we treat an individual's cancer, but we have to think about treating the whole person, 
not just the disease. So I say that, you know, we we talked about, they wrote a paper on this that we published last year, but really talking about moving away from that disease-centric approach to a more person-centric approach. We're not just treating the disease, but the person, because anything that we do to that individual can have long-term consequences. And so we really talking, when we're talking about survivorship and what that means for individuals, we want them to be free of their cancer, but we also want them to be healthy as well. I was have been involved with the development of the International Cardio-Oncology Society, which has been in existence now for several years. And it's, it's a not-for-profit uh, organization now with a approximately a thousand members from 25 with 25 chapter countries. And a few years ago, uh, I was asked to uh, represent this organization, putting together the European Society of Cardiology, Cardio-Oncology Guidelines. So these guidelines were published last year in August of 2022 in the European Heart Journal. And these guidelines in cardio-oncology were really meant to take all the evidence pr from the previous position papers and guidelines and update them to our current state of the knowledge. This guideline, all 133 pages of it, which is an extensive guideline, really uh, focuses on a number of key areas that I think are very important when you think of treating patients with cancer and cardio-oncology. One is, how do we risk stratify those patients prior to starting their cancer treatment? So who is at risk? And identifying those patients at very high or very high risk of experiencing cardiovascular toxicity. Then taking those individuals who are at risk and looking at primary prevention strategies. So we know they're at high risk. How can we prevent that cardiovascular toxicity? The guidelines then speak to how do we monitor patients during their cancer therapy? How do we treat any cancer therapy related cardiovascular toxicity? And importantly, talks about that first year after you've finished your cancer therapy and long-term cancer survivorship. How do we monitor those patients? So it really talks about the whole cancer journey, right from prior to starting treatment, well into after you complete your treatment. And I think that's very important because as oncologists, we have tended to be more reactive. We wait until an individual develops a cardiovascular issue and then we ask our cardiology colleagues to help us. We need to move towards prevention rather than just treatment when the trouble already happens. Currently, the, the, the treatment in terms of what happens to an individual should they develop cancer treatment related to cardiovascular toxicity Many of the treatments rely on treatments that were developed in the non-cancer population. So they go according to, you know, either the American College of Cardiology guidelines or the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, uh, which is the best data we have now. I think this is an area open for research where we need to get gain a better understanding of are those the best treatment options for patients with cancer versus the non-cancer population. So that's right now where things are. And of course, those, those treatment options will depend on the type of cardiotoxicity the individual develops. And I should say, it's not just about heart failure. We know it can be things like increased risk of thromboembolic events or clotting, arrhythmias, uh, exacerbation or increase in hypertension as well. So it's not just about heart failure. But having said that, and this is where I think the field is moving. So yes, we are getting better at managing problems when they occur. I think the field really has to move towards identifying those patients at risk and trying to prevent these cardiovascular toxicities from happening. And that's where I think they'll need, we'll need a lot of education of the oncologist because it's going to be the oncologists really who are using these risk assessment tools, trying to identify those patients at risk and ideally referring those patients to the cardio-oncologist or the cardiologist with expertise in this area to work with them to prevent the cardiovascular toxicity. So it's a big mind shift, but I think prevention, right? Treatment is great. And of course, we'll continue to treat these people, but ideally we want to prevent these issues from happening in the first place.
I think the future success for patients is access to the best available cancer therapies, which we know are evolving rapidly, um, while not only optimizing, but enhancing cardiovascular health. We should be encouraging patients to be active participants in their care. We should be encouraging patients not only to work with us to, to manage their risk factors such as diabetes or hypertension, but we should also be encouraged them for, to, to work on lifestyle factors such as quit smoking, exercise, eat a healthy diet. All of these things are equally important because we can't do everything with medications, nor should we. I think it's that combination of lifestyle interventions, prevention, and medication or medical interventions when needed. So I think we need to look at all of that. And you cannot accomplish that unless you have a multidisciplinary approach, including the primary care providers, oncologists, cardiologists, pharmacists, nurses, but importantly, you need to have the patients engaged and they need to be an active participant in their own care.